Our next speaker this morning is Derek Scasta, who is a herbivore interactions ecologist, as well as a rangeland extension specialist and assistant professor of rangeland management at the University of Wyoming in Laramie. For the past 14 years, he has worked throughout the Great Plains and Front Range region with private, state, and federal partners on a wide variety of natural resource related issues, including wildfire, feral horses, livestock, wildlife conflicts, drought, and education. Dr. Scasta holds a BS from Texas A&M in rangeland ecology, an MS from Texas Tech in crop science, and a PhD from Oklahoma State in natural resources management. All right. Thank you, Clint. So, as was mentioned, my name is Derek Scasta. I'm with the University of Wyoming, and I've been working on this issue of horses for about four years now. And uh, what I'm going to try to do this morning is to paint this in-depth and broad picture of the situation um, because it's complex, it's emotionally sensitive, it's charged. Um, and I'm going to share some information um, from some recent travels I did to Australia and New Zealand, which also have horses. Um, as a matter of fact, this is a picture of Kaimanawa horses in New Zealand. Um, and there's some encouraging uh, examples of, I think, some balance between uh, society and then ecological concerns um, that are underway that could inform what we're doing here in the U.S., just a quick plug, there was a special issue of Human Wildlife Interactions, uh, a journal that has a paper uh, colleagues and I put in um, that includes a lot of the references uh, for the data and figures I'll show you. So I encourage you to check that out. It's freely available. Um, it's the first issue of this year. So to really get an in-depth grasp on the horse situation, we've got to go way back in time and think about the uh, evolutionary history of horses. And horses originated in North America. The majority of the equidae species um, were on this continent. And there was really a diverse assemblage of equids, um, as depicted here um, in a piece of artwork in, from the American uh, Natural History Museum. And they were very different. So Hypohippus was a three-toed shrub browsing species. Dinohippus was a single-toed uh, grass grazing species. And so um, this was a really diverse assemblage that's quite different from what we see today in North America. Um, equids went extinct about 10,000 years ago, and then about 6,000 years ago, they were domesticated in Eurasia. Um, it's thought right now that it was the Bowtie people in Kazakhstan um, that originally uh, domesticated horses because they had dispersed through the, the world um, from North America. Um, here, they were reintroduced by colonial explorers. As a matter of fact, um, Columbus brought horses in his second voyage back uh, in 1493. So where are the horses in North America? So this is a map from the Bureau of Land Management. Um, you'll note the blue polygons, those are horse management areas. Um, so I'm from Wyoming. Uh, we don't really have any burrows, so there's no uh, orange polygons. Um, which represent burrow management areas. And then there's a few areas that have both horses and burrows um, that you'll want to note. So when you look at that map, you'll just notice in terms of land area occupied that Nevada uh, is kind of the center of the bullseye in terms of uh, wild horses. Um, in this figure here, this is 2017 data um, by state in terms of the number of horses and burrows, the total of all the equids, and then the maximum AML. Um, AML is appropriate management level. It's the number that um, has been determined for kind of a thriving um, population of horses in concert with other uses um, and other organisms on the landscape. Um, so currently, Nevada has over 30,000 horses. Wyoming usually has um, the second most horses in the country, um, 7,000 in this estimate. And then here in Utah, um, third or fourth, close to the numbers in California, about 5,000 horses. In total, uh, there's over 59,000 horses estimated in the U.S. and over 13,000 burrows, and that's on range. That's out on range. There's also horses in Canada. Um, these are some pictures from a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Sonia Levirkis. This is another paper from that same special issue. Um, similar concerns, um, some unique things as far as crown land and how that's managed, um, but just want to point out that horses uh, free range uh, up through Canada as well. So back to the question of how many horses are there. Um, 
So when you add up the total horses um, and burrows, there's over 72,000 on range. But there's another 47,000 or so horses and burrows in temporary holding. So <clears throat> today, that's kind of the solution to, to many of these horses that are removed from uh, Western lands as they're put into temporary holding. But I want to point out that even though this number, 100, 110,000, um, is a lot of equids, it's, it's really nuanced because it only represents BLM horses. So there was a report that came out to Congress um, this last year that estimated that there's 90,000 horses on tribal lands. Um, so the big player in that is the Navajo Nation. It's estimated they have over 30,000 horses. But even this number should have a, an asterisk next to it because it's only the eight tribes that are part of the Tribal Horse Coalition, and these are midpoint values. So that doesn't include tribes in Wyoming like Northern Arapaho, in Eastern Shoshone, uh, we certainly have horses on our Wind River Indian Reservation um, that probably don't account for that. So um, just keep that in mind when you see those numbers that it, it's uh, not including a, a other um, land jurisdiction. Um, this graph here shows um, the total range, um, on-range estimates of horses and burrows since 1971. That's when the, the wild free roaming horse and burrow act was passed. Um, this is the AML line here, and I'll just note that we've never been under AML. And then we can zoom in to the last decade or so, and I just want to point out that it's really been a dramatic increase in horses. Um, when we use regression, we've been accumulating through just natural reproduction about 4,000 horses and burrows a year for about the last 10 years. So um, when you look at this time series figure, it's been a pretty dramatic increase um, as of late. This figure just shows horses, um, and you'll just see this line here, so I don't want you to pay attention to. The black dots are the on-range population estimates, and these white dots are the number of animals that were adopted. And I just want to show you that it's been a, a decline in adoption rates about over the last 25 years. So um, as far as how much of a solution adoption can play, um, it seems to be um, less and less effective over time. So what does this cost? What does this cost to the government and the taxpayers? This figure comes from a paper by Bob Garrett up in Montana. Um, I'll just give you some orientation. This is number of horses in captivity. This is cumulative cost in millions of dollars, and this is extrapolated um, in a predictive way through time. So in 2013, the cost for uh, horses in captivity was around $76 million. Um, the costs are expected to reach $500 million by 2021, um, and that's assuming that there's this kind of plateau in the numbers of horses in captivity. So uh, the cost to manage these horses is really expensive, and it's just going to get more expensive through time. This is just a picture to give you a visual impression of horses in a federal holding facility. So this is mares and foals at the BLM facility in Rock Springs. Um, they separate mares with foals from uh, stallions. And then these horses will be processed and usually go somewhere else eventually. So in terms of the legislation that guides the management of horses, there's a lot of attention that's paid to the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrow Act of 1971. That was signed into law by President Nixon. It's been amended uh, many times afterwards. And this is an important piece of legislation because it established wild horses or feral horses, and I will use those interchangeably. We can do a whole presentation on those terms, but um, it established them as a cultural icon uh, for the West, but it also began to give authority to the BLM to manage those horses. <clears throat> but I argue that the 1971 Act and its amendments alone isn't the, the last word on horse management. There's also two pieces of Act as a range extension specialists that are important to me, and that's the 1976 FLIPMA, Federal Land Policy and Management Act, and then the 1978 Public Range Lands Improvement Act. And I'll point out why these are really important for the management of horse populations. FLIPMA 1976 really established the concept of multiple use, which is kind of this underlying part of the theme of the conference. It also gave authority to use helicopters and motor vehicles to um, gather and manage horses um, with appropriate uh, permissions and review. So it established those as tools for um, gathering horses. 
the Public Rangelands Improvement Act of 1978 mandated that federal agencies conduct an inventory of animals on public land and establish appropriate management levels, or AMLs. It also explicitly stipulates that there should be humane adoption or disposal of excess wild free roaming horses and burrows. So legislation is kind of this evolving process where there's more and more layers that go into the uh, complexity of managing horses and western rangelands. Layered on top of that is this issue of litigation. And it's not just litigation in and of itself. So the U.S., in case you didn't know, is the most litigious society in the world. We spend a lot of money suing each other. And in the name of horses, it's really a problem. So just bear with me. Um, on the left, I have four examples of case law where someone sued the government for managing horses because the government was managing horses. So 2009 in Defense of Animals versus Salazar, who's... Uh, Director of Interior, um, would bar the defendants BLM from implementing a plan to capture or gather 2,700 horses in western Nevada. Um, 2013 Cloud Foundation challenged BLM's early September planned gather of wild horses on the range. On the opposite side, we have litigation of the federal government for not managing horses and burrows. So 2006 Colvin Cattle Company alleged failure to prevent wild horses from infringing on water rights. 2013, Rock Springs Grazing Association, this is Wyoming, this is my country, um, to remove all horses that are straight onto uh, RSGA lands. Uh, 2015, Pershing County, failure to address horse and burrow populations in excess of AML. So the BLM is sued when they don't do anything. The BLM is sued when they do something. So in essence, they're caught right here in the middle. And so it's kind of stymieing any um, proactive efforts. Within this, we have horse advocacy and I would say horse activism um, at times. There's a lot of emotion. People really care about horses. The missing piece right now, in my mind, is that we're not putting it into context. So we know that people have emotional concern for horse welfare and persistence. It's innate. So I have three daughters at home. We absolutely love horses in my house. It's this innate, childlike giddiness. When you see a horse, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing, right? We have a saying in Wyoming, the outside of a horse is good for the inside of a man, right? It's a really therapeutic thing. It's used in therapy. What's unrecognized is that these horses must rely upon sustainable rangeland resources for the provision of things that all wildlife and all livestock need, so space, food, shelter. And what happens is we get into situations where horses are not in great condition. And I'll talk about this photo more um, in just a little bit. So we've got to link up this emotion with concern about the rangeland which supports horses. Um, just a side note, I'm going to sh share some research with you. Uh, my eyes have been opened quite a bit in terms of the uh, resistance to even researching uh, horses. So we have a GPS collar project I'll show you data from. Um, it was appealed. Uh, the appeal was thrown out. But in the process of the appeal, our research team was called serial horse abusers. We were told that we needed psychological examination and that it was a conspiracy to kill horses in the name of science, simply to understand horse ecology. Those were by some, uh, some advocate groups. So. It's kind of a messy, messy situation. So why is it so difficult to separate horses and humans? 6,000 years ago, horses were domesticated, and it changed everything about human society. From travel to warfare to commerce, everything changed. So let me ask you a question. How do you describe the power of your vehicle, Mark? Horsepower. <clears throat> this transformative effect is evident today. We still describe things in these equine-related terms. And it's because it dramatically changed how human genes and agriculture spread throughout the world. Um, these are just two pieces of art that are pretty telling, in my opinion. So this is a mounted Mongolian warrior. Um, this is a horse culture. Um, everything that they did revolved around the horse. Um, when horses were reintroduced to North America, the Plains Indian tribes... Um, 
adapted and embraced the horse very quickly, and it changed everything about their lifestyle. So it's been transformative. And I think that's why there's this innate um, attraction and, and emotional concern about horses. Because if these people didn't take care of their horses, their survival was affected. Their ability to protect their family was affected. Okay, so now I'm going to lay out some concerns um, about horses in the West, um, and I'm going to lump them into four categories. So the first is horse welfare. Um, this is one area of agreement. Everybody agrees that horses should and deserve um, good welfare and humane treatment. What that is is what people don't agree on, but let's say we all have concern that we want healthy populations. So I showed you this mare with a foal. Um, so this mare was... Um, gathered in an emergency effort in 2015 from the Wheeler Pass HMA. Um, she's extremely emaciated. There's a lot of concerns with her. More recently, um, almost 200 horses died um, around a shrinking uh, water source on the Navajo Nation. So this is um, in uh, Arizona. This has been picked up by Washington Post AP press release. So when these things happen, that's really difficult to look at. But it's a function of humans and how we're deciding to manage or not manage horses. Okay, so the second is overgrazing and resource sustainability. Um, the tragedy of the commons. So extensive use of public rangelands can lead to degradation. Predating the 1971 Act, we have the Taylor Grazing Act of 1934. This is when we began to apportion and regulate grazing on public lands. The reason is... This is kind of a basic intro to range management figure. So no grazing, moderate, heavy, very heavy. As grazing intensity increases, above and below ground, parts of plants are affected. If we manage grazing, we either manage at a moderate level or we apply varying levels of use with adequate periods of rest and recovery. Unmanaged grazing by any herbivore, rabbits, horses, cows, sheep, elk, can escalate utilization to a very heavy level for an unforeseen period of time. So for western rangelands, that's a big concern. If we stay over here for too long, we're going to start to lose perennial plants, um, and that can lead to desertification. So dietary competition, what they eat, how they eat, and how much of it they eat. Um, so we did a big study. I'm going to breeze through some of this because I'm short on time, and I got some awesome Australia pictures to show you. But we did a big study. Uh, horse and cattle consumed the same amount of graminoids, grasses. Cattle and elk and horses consumed similar forbs in terms of diet composition. And then cattle, sheep, and horses can consume similar browse or shrub components in their diets. To boil that down, horses and cows both like grass. Their diets, if it's available, will be 75% grass or more. So these are potentially conflicting uses of range. Um, because of their diet um, preferences. It's also how they eat it. Horses are different than livestock and wildlife. Horses have upper incisors, and consequently they can um, graze down to a lower level than, say, cattle, who have very rigid lips. They don't have upper incisors. That makes them different from, um, but also different from uh, native wildlife as well. And then how much they eat. So get this all up here. Horses are not true ruminants. They're hindgut fermenters, okay, in the cecum. This means they have a shorter passage time, so plant biomass goes from front to back quicker. They're less efficient, and this is leading to a high intake strategy. So a horse of an equivalent size as a cow will eat 20 to 65% more plant material by volume, okay? If you have horses, you know that. It goes through them. It's a high intake strategy that they've evolved with to live on rangelands with um, low quality forage for much of the year. Impacts on native wildlife. Um, so I'm in Wyoming, we have a lot of sage grouse. Um, this shows areas, these dark areas are horse occupied areas with sage grouse. I'll get to this quickly here. In Wyoming, that's almost 100%. Utah, it's only about 10%. We don't know much beyond that. We know excessive grazing is problematic for nest success of sage grouse. We need more research on this. Um, there's more recent research than this, but around watering holes, horse occupancy can deter antelope from coming into water. We're really concerned about antelope populations in Wyoming right now. We have like half of the world's pronghorn antelope in the state of Wyoming. 
iconic big game species like elk. So this is from the wildlife professional. Um, game cameras showing horses running elk off from a spring um, in Colorado. So this physical deterrence of uh, native wildlife. So some of the research we're doing, uh, this is courtesy of my PhD student, Jay Kinnig. We're looking at GPS collars. So collars have been used on um, wild equids worldwide, zebras. This is a Preswalski's horse. This is an Asiatic wild ass. Um, to look at movement patterns, resource selection, interaction with co-occurring species. Uh, some of these are threatened and endangered wild equids that we're concerned about conserving. Um, we have about 30 collars um, southeast of Rock Springs on the Adobe Town HMA. A couple of really cool um, examples that we can show you. So we've used bait trapping and helicopter gather. Here's some of our initial mares with collars before they went back out on range. We have two types of collars. Um, we tried to keep groups intact when we could. And here's kind of this general distribution. We call this the checkerboard. This is alternating uh, sections or square miles of public-private land, which makes it difficult to manage. A couple of case studies. This mare was released here. This is the HMA. She immediately left the HMA and spent all summer outside of the designated area for which she's supposed to be. So if we focus all of our efforts here, there's probably horses outside of these designated areas. Second case study, this mare here was released in Adobe Town. She left and went to a different HMA, and I'll just point out she spends about half of her time on private land. So private land is providing forage and other resources for horses in the West. And then a third case study, this is the state line here. Um, this mare, she went back and forth, and she had crucial range overlap with pronghorn, winter range, mule deer, and sage grouse, and a third of her time was spent in Colorado. Well, there's jurisdictional boundaries, right? There's a Colorado horse program director. There's a Wyoming horse program director. And so there can be this dis disparity between states. Wyoming's fairly aggressive in, in their program. Okay, global perspective. So I went to Australia and New Zealand. So they have horses there. Australia has more feral horses than anywhere else in the world. New Zealand's got a small population. Um, there are some other differences. Australia horses are not federally protected. That's a difference. And then... These two countries did not have horses originally. They did not evolve with hard-hooved animals like we did here in North America. So just some pictures for some, some visual impressions. Horses in this eucalyptus uh, forest. There's definitely some shrub grass dominated areas. This is in Kosciuszko National Park, which is high alpine um, areas, New South Wales. A lot of concern about horse grazing in these riparian areas, uh, pugging of pastures, um, incising and then draining, and the plant community can change. Um, similar work has been shown in the Sheldon Wildlife Refuge here in North America. Uh, Chad Boyd has a paper. Um, there's exclosures that show some of this. There's no livestock in this area. There are exotic deer um, that have been introduced as well. Um, and then kind of another visual impression. This is New Zealand. When I was there, they were doing a, a gather or a muster, they would call it, um, using helicopters and ground crews. And they get, they get in there pretty quick, pretty close. Um, New Zealanders are pretty pragmatic, hands-on people. I really, really got along with them well. Those are all stallions, by the way, captured that day. Never been that close to a human, probably. Um, some large groups coming together, coming towards the corrals. And I just want to point out the landscapes where these horses occur are dramatic. They're harsh, topographically difficult. And this is my final New Zealand picture. What was really cool about New Zealand was horse advocate groups were running the rehoming and adoption program, not the government. Volunteers were working many hours a day to get every horse that was gathered adopted. The other thing was those advocacy groups accepted the government's data on what the government suggested was a sustainable population of horses. And they built their management around that. So it was really collaborative, synergistic process that is one of the more encouraging um, activities that I've seen. So we put together a bunch of stuff. Just look at it this way. Social. That was the big thing. We looked at consistent themes across countries. There was a lot of social things. We looked at unique things. Social. We can do all the ecology, biology we want to. It comes down to some social decision making. So where are we in the U.S.? Um, lawsuits against um, research on um, 
sterilization, lawsuits on culling wild horses, and then decisions about funding are just kicked around in Congress. So not much has changed. So I'll wrap up with this. We have to link emotion with recognition of rangeland sustainability, and we need more evidence-based management in the U.S., kind of like in New Zealand. So we have a lot of collaborators. They're awesome, um, state and federal, uh, that I'm really proud to work with. So I think I may have gone to time. I apologize, but uh, thank you for your attention. You were spot on with time. Very good. Okay. Uh, so we have some time for questions. Where are we going, Clint? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Right here. It's a great question. Um, so why, why such a dramatic increase? <clears throat> I think probably in part, there has been a variability in government gathering activities. So I think there was probably no activity for a number of years. Um, probably some wet years, although 2012 was in there, which was a dry year. But on either side of that, we had some average to wet years. But that, that's all I can guess. You know, there is um, theory that when you, when you do remove, you artificially alter the, the reproductive dynamics and it can, can increase, um, can kind of release like mare productivity because they're in better condition. But yeah, those are my thoughts. Not, not a great answer. Sorry about that. Question over back. So, so the question was, how does New Zealand compare to North America in terms of climate? Is it as intensive a situation? So it's, it's definitely wetter. These are red tussock grasslands. Um, but there's a paper that shows excessive horses r reduce floral diversity there. And um, DOC, which is Department of Conservation, they have authority. So I got to ride along with a guy for a ways. And he was saying that, that the success today is built on like 20 years of efforts. And it was just as politically charged when they first got started. The other difference is that's a small number of horses. So adoption there might be their solution, but there's questions about that. How sustainable is it? They, they had a hard time getting the, the number of horses adopted out. And it's a small country too. So it, it is very different in many ways. That's a great point. But it's promising. So after the gather, we sat around, we, we had a beer and like a debriefing, and there's the pilots, advocate groups, government people, volunteers, everybody, everybody is in agreement that they were working towards the betterment of the land and the horses. In one room, no yelling, pats on the backs, attaboys and attagirls. So 